8 a.m., the press room of the San Francisco Examiner. Four giant cylinders are feeding 300 pages a second through the press, producing 20,000 newspapers in an hour. For the Examiner and the other 1,500 papers published each day in the United States, the process begins hours earlier at the daily news meeting where the executive editor meets with his department heads to determine what stories will run that day. My job is to be responsible for and oversee the paper as a whole. That means the news hole, the non-advertising part of the newspaper. It's uh, the place where we put what it is we do every day. So usually that ranges in various papers we like to think it's 50-50, so in other words, the news of the newspaper, the editorial product of the newspaper gets less than 50% as compared with the ads. News is drawn from an enormous variety of issues and events. In order to cope with this vast and ever-changing landscape, newspapers long ago established the tradition of assigning correspondents to cover regular beats, like the White House. I'll have more to say about that at a later time. Nothing can replace being at the White House. I mean, to actually be one-on-one, -on -one, eyeball to eyeball with the President of the United States. Today, no matter how quickly newspaper reporters react, they cannot keep pace with the flow of information. While a story can get its start in many different ways, Journalists who cover international news often say their topics are now selected for them by other media. Television is the tripwire. We have, I think, six or seven television sets in the newsroom. They're tuned to CNN, to C-SPAN. CNN really is a realization of a global village that when you sit here and watch bombs falling in Iraq uh, on Baghdad that CNN is transmitting. You know that someone in the Kremlin is watching the same picture. Although newspapers have never been unbiased, the expectation that they give the public a reliable report about what is happening in the world has afforded the press special protections and privileges not extended to other businesses. In our society, there is no other institution except for the press that really can make a president accountable, can question a president. If you can't question a president, he can be a dictator. He can rule by edict, by order. So I, I really put reporters on a high plane in our society because that's what makes the democracy. In following a story, reporters rely on their own observation interviews with sources and public records even so many claim that arriving at the truth is a challenge I think that news has always been managed certainly since I've been covering the White House managed manipulated controlled but I think that's always been true in our country there have, been, there have been reports that you were told directly or indirectly at least twice that the Contras were benefiting from the Iran arms sales. Is that true? And I'd like to follow on. Helen, let me just say, no, that is not true at all. It became a state of the art in the Reagan era. We get spin every day here. Thank you. But certainly, you didn't answer the question on Coindexter. Did they deceive you? You didn't answer whether Coindexter uh, and North deceived you. Every president I've covered has tried to manage the news and control the output and the uh, outlook. The process of shaping a story is one of give and take between a reporter and her editor. Always, they are on a race to meet the deadline. Okay. Yeah. We'll, you know, in an hour and a half, we'll lose the ability to report it. So right. uh, uh, okay, let's just grab what we can, and then, then we'll slow. We're driven by by getting things quickly, and in the surge to to get there first, sometimes the truth is sacrificed, and we have to keep going back to what my assistant city editor told me when I was a copy boy 
on the verge of becoming a reporter. Get it first, but first get it right. Reporters work on video display terminals connected to the paper's main computer. Their stories go directly to a copy desk for editing. The graphic arts department supplies photos and illustrations. Yeah. <laughs> Some photos are shot by staff photographers. Others are retrieved from an Associated Press database that contains over 500 images and is updated every 24 hours. Based on the contents of that day's news, the design director works on the look of the front page, keeping in mind the specific criteria of his paper. We're an afternoon paper, and we sell an inordinate amount of newspapers, single copy, on the street. So we really have to have a front page and a whole newspaper that attracts people's attention and makes them want to put their quarter into the box each and every day. So we run large headlines. The last person to see the paper before it goes to press is the news editor. He is the man who must catch the mistakes before they happen. Grids holding the dummied up type are sent to the engraving department. Here, stories, photos and ads are placed on a piece of waxed photographic paper. The exact size of a newspaper page. A laser reader scans the pages and transmits their image via microwave to the printing plant, five miles away. Laser writing machines transfer the image of the page onto a piece of film. A technician places a thin plate of polymer plastic onto the negative of the film. A machine washes water over the plate, leaving a raised image of the page on the surface of the plastic. Workers wrap the plates around cylinders, one plate per page. Each cylinder holds a total of 16 plates. Robots transport 1,700 pound rolls of newsprint, seven miles long, to the press. As the paper is fed through the press, pages are automatically cut, folded and collated into separate newspapers. Although each step happens at top speed, reporters admit they are no longer in the business of breaking news, whether they work for the Examiner or any of the morning newspapers. By the time a reader of our newspaper picks it up off the doorstep at 7 o'clock the morning after I've written the story, he's seen the fact that there has been bombing in Bosnia or that there is an economic meltdown in Russia, he's heard that on the evening news, and he's heard it on breakfast time. Editors believe that newspapers should fulfill a broader function. Our responsibility, in a sense, is to present our readers with things that they don't get anywhere else. So it's not simply to inform or to engage in public service, which we also should do. But it's also to amuse, to entertain, to shock, to outrage. Indeed, the history of the newspaper itself is an emotionally charged story. From the propaganda pamphlets of the Revolutionary War to the censorship of the socialist press during World War I. The death of a king, danger to the nation, or the emergence of a new leader have always been considered newsworthy events. In the ancient world, as through much of human history, such news was delivered by the only means available, word of mouth. From even the earliest times, a high premium was placed on the speed and accuracy of the news. Messengers were trained to heighten their physical endurance and to sharpen their memory by rhyming phrases into long epics like the Iliad. One of the first improvements on spoken news occurred in ancient Rome, when Julius Caesar initiated a daily news sheet with reports on the Roman Senate.
During the Middle Ages, monks and scribes laboriously reproduced manuscripts by hand. Then in the 1440s in Mainz, Germany, Johann Gutenberg began experimenting with movable type. By casting individual letters out of metal, he created pieces of type that could be combined and recombined over and over again. In a process that took two years, he set and printed an edition of the Bible. Gutenberg's invention forever changed the course of human history. Its full impact made itself felt 50 years later in 1493, when a press reproduced a thousand copies of a letter written by Christopher Columbus to his queen, announcing the discovery of a new world. The newspaper was on its way. But by modern day standards, information moved at a snail's pace. In colonial America, newly arrived settlers waited for months for news from home traveling by ship. The earliest efforts at reporting, actually, in the United States were simply printers walking down to the docks and trying to get the news a little bit quicker so they could put it into their newspaper. Then somebody got even more industrious and they got a rowboat and rowed out and met the ships a little bit earlier. Newspapers were a spirited voice in colonial society. After the British Crown imposed a harsh stamp tax on the sale of newspapers, publishers like Benjamin Franklin used bold graphics to trumpet the cause of independence and became a major force in fueling the Revolutionary War. These papers were not objective, they were not fair. They chose sides and they fought for that side and they helped make a revolution by doing that. At the beginning of the 19th century, news was still traveling only as fast as men could carry it. One of the great stories of the slowness of news is the War of 1812. The War of 1812 ended, this was a peace treaty signed in Europe, but they didn't find out about it in the United States for many weeks after that. So the biggest battle of the war, the Battle of New Orleans, was fought after the war ended. During the early 19th century, papers were printed on a flatbed press. Printers operated the heavy machinery by hand. The process was slow and expensive. The newspaper had pretty much a rich audience. It was expensive to buy. It cost six cents a copy, which was a significant percentage of uh, a working person's salary in those days. So working people really weren't reading newspapers. In the 1830s, the newly invented steam engine was harnessed to power the press, and suddenly thousands of copies could be reproduced. At the same time, the manufacture of cheaper paper and the rise of urban transportation systems enabled publishers to cut the price of their newspapers to a penny a copy. But it was not until the 1840s that the news business would be truly transformed by a new invention, the telegraph. The telegraph, of course, brought faster news, and uh, it allowed news organizations, newspapers all over the country to have information transmitted by correspondents in the field instantaneously across telegraph wires. The telegraph played a crucial part in perhaps the biggest news story to ever hit the United States, the Civil War. It was the story that people most wanted and needed to know about. So during the Civil War, the success of your newspaper depended on your ability to get reports of battles back as quickly as possible. By its very nature, the mechanics of transmitting by telegraph dictated the manner in which stories were written. It was very expensive to transmit this information. We got a change in the style of newspapers. Newspapers went from being long, uh, elegant essays to short, truncated reports. And something comparable to the writing of the present day with a, a short lead and with the movement eventually from the most important item first and then in descending order, the rest of the information. Newspaper publishing was becoming an important industry, and New York City its center. In the 1880s, a German immigrant named Joseph Pulitzer established the world, hired a few top journalists and graphic designers, and turned news into entertainment. <laughs> 
there was a revolution in graphics, in design, in display. They brought in a, a sense of uh, sensationalism and a sense of excitement and a spirited notion of journalism. The press went from being uh, kind of the gray lady to uh, bold, brassy headlines. By mixing sensationalism and entertainment, Pulitzer created yellow journalism and built an empire. It was not long before a transplant from California, William Randolph Hearst, entered the scene. The 33-year-old Hearst purchased the New York Journal in hopes of stealing a piece of Pulitzer's market share. His first coup was the reporting of a seemingly obscure incident 50 miles off the coast of Florida on the Spanish-owned island of Cuba. Hearst heard a story of a young Cuban woman who was arrested and placed in a Spanish jail in Cuba. And boy, did he run with this story. He sent a reporter down to rescue her. And he got this woman out of jail and brought her back to New York and paraded her through the streets of New York as a great heroine. The following week, an unexplained explosion in Havana's harbor, in which the American battleship, the Maine, was destroyed, gave Hearst the excuse he needed to promote war with Spain. Indeed, the notion of you provide the pictures, I'll provide the war uh, was uh, a message supposedly from Hearst to his, uh, his editors and correspondents in the field in Cuba. From the point of view of newspaper publishers, the Spanish-American War was a huge success. It was a nice short war. Uh, the correspondents, who, many of whom had helped really start the war by uh, fanning anti-Spanish sentiment in this country, were all over the place, covering things like uh, Teddy Roosevelt's ride up San Juan Hill. Six years later, Roosevelt's well-publicized heroics won him the presidency. The fierce competition between dailies forced publishers to resort to theatrics to sell papers. In one of the most widely publicized of these escapades, Nellie Bly, a New York World reporter, set out to challenge Jules Verne's fictional account by going around the world in less than 80 days. People were back home rooting for her. Would Nellie make it? They were taking wagers on her. These were the days of stunt journalism when James Gordon Bennett Jr. sent uh, Henry Morton Stanley to find Dr. Livingston in Africa. And the famous quote, Dr. Livingstone, I presume, comes from a story in the New York Herald. People who themselves really weren't traveling much in these days live vicariously through some of these newspaper adventures. The circulation of the Pulitzer and Hearst dailies each exceeded more than one million readers. Throughout the country, newspaper barons amassed such astounding fortunes that many entered the highest ranks of the Fortune 500. No one suspected that the future of the newspaper might soon be in jeopardy. During the first decade of the new century, newspapers reached the zenith of their power. They were the fastest and most reliable way to get the news, with extra editions published up to three times a day. Intrepid journalists searched for new beats that would give them an edge over competitors. During Teddy Roosevelt's administration, one reporter even camped outside the gates of the White House. Pretty soon he was nabbing everyone who would come in to see President Roosevelt and was getting great stories about Teddy and so forth. And after that, other reporters around town thought that must be the best beat in town. And pretty soon when it rained and so forth, uh, Roosevelt took very big notice of all of this and set aside a room in the White House. The press room established at the White House still exists to this day. We had squatters rights. We came in, we stayed. We were the man who came to dinner. Stories from the White House may have sold papers, but advertisers paid for them. The idea of newspapers was that you would 
create the largest possible audience, get advertisers to support them, and then provide the newspaper to the public for the lowest possible cost. And so newspapers would cost five cents, but it might cost five dollars to produce the newspaper, the individual paper, and the advertiser paid the freight. In 1914, after war broke out in Europe, newspapers played an important role in turning American public opinion against Germany. There was an intense fever in the country at that time that depicted uh, the troops of the Kaiser as Huns eating babies, and all kinds of rumors were spread by newspapers and propagandists, and uh, they worked hand in hand and played a big role in mobilizing American public opinion for World War I. Sentiment was so strong that Congress passed the Espionage and Sedition Act, making it a crime for publishers to print anything that attacked President Wilson's policy. When a few socialist publications disobeyed, they were shut down. At first, the war was perceived as a romantic adventure, but dispatches from the front sent back by war correspondents like Ernest Hemingway brought home the grim reality of trench warfare and poison gas. The newly invented medium of film made these images even more vivid. Just a decade later, the impact of other technological advances were making themselves felt across the United States. This is WJC New York. As Saturday dawned over the vast Atlantic, the Lindbergh plane is unreported since passing Newfoundland early last night. By the time Charles Lindbergh completed the first successful transatlantic flight, wire photos could be sent over telephone lines. Data signals translated into gray dots and reproduced a perfect image. The process took less than 10 minutes. The radio had just reached the height of its audience and newsreels. The, uh, the newsreel had come along as a part of the Saturday afternoon movie, so he had, suddenly you had a multimedia effect. And Charles Lindbergh steps into this and becomes perhaps the most celebrated person in uh, human history up to that point. With newspapers leading the way, people everywhere knew Charles Lindbergh. He would eventually pay a high price for his celebrity status. His infant son was kidnapped and murdered. The trial that followed turned into such a media circus that Lindbergh ended up leaving the United States. The press wielded so much influence that during the 1930s and 40s, a number of columnists became celebrities in their own right. Walter Lippmann, the intellectual editor of the New York World, whose opinion was so respected that presidents would not make a move without his advice. Walter Winchell, a veteran of the vaudevillian stage whose chatty column brought the public gossip about everyone from Clark Gable to the Prince of Wales. And Will Rogers, whose folksy commentary in the Los Angeles Times was so popular that he soon became the homespun hero of the silver screen. Even comic strips and their creators achieved national fame. Comic strips also could be quite ideological, and they, they had a particular point of view they tried to get across. Uh, Rex Morgan was almost a PR uh, tool for the American Medical Association. Uh, he was just the sainted doctor. Mary Worth was the ultimate social worker. It was a, a simple way through attitudinal graphics to convey ideas. Newspaper publishers like the Chandler family of Los Angeles were so influential that they often selected political candidates. They certainly promoted certain candidates as opposed to others. They were very fond of Richard Nixon, for example. And over the years, they were regarded as one of the, the uh, rock beds of, of American conservatism. It was often said that unless the Chandlers and the people at the Los Angeles Times vetted the candidates, the people simply didn't get elected to public office. But a change was occurring in the world of news, one that would drastically alter the role of the newspaper. Radio was beginning to gain ground. No, no, I'm speaking of a theater. Oh, Sid Gorman's Chinese. Oh, is he really? 
He doesn't look it. <laughs> as a form of entertainment, radio had been around for nearly a decade. But as a means of transmitting the news, radio was not taken seriously until the first German tanks rolled across Europe. The new medium created was broadcast journalism. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii by air, President Roosevelt has just announced. Pearl Harbor was bombed on a Sunday afternoon, and Sunday was the one day when there were no afternoon newspapers back on the East Coast. So the very early reports on the bombing of Pearl Harbor were on radio, and people had to really turn to radio to find out what was going on in those days. The radio brought eyewitness accounts home to Americans, sitting in their living rooms, in ways which had never before been possible. speaking from London. There were more German planes over the coast of Britain today than at any time since the war began. Edward R. Murrow would take his microphone and aim it at the sidewalk so you could hear the sound of somebody sweeping up broken glass after a night of German bombing. There was an immediacy to radio coverage of World War II which was new and powerful. But newspaper reporters brought their own special talents to the front. Hundreds went overseas. While most donned the uniforms of officers and relayed events from that privileged perspective, syndicated columnist Ernie Pyle was the exception. His dispatches from the beaches of Normandy and the islands of the Pacific captured the feelings of the ordinary GI. Like many of the men he wrote about, he was killed in action on Okinawa in 1945. By the end of the war, the very nature and delivery of news had been transformed. Radio broadcasts left people with an expectation of more immediacy. And film increased their expectation for a more visceral experience of reality. Newspaper circulation was on the wane, and print journalism was in trouble. Through the 1950s, the newspaper printing press was a dangerous and toxic place to work. Linotype operators poured molten lead into frames to cast lines of type. They mounted the heavy plates onto cylinders, which pressed the raised surface of the type onto newsprint. Reporters didn't have it easy either. Correspondents in the field had few reliable links with their editors back at the paper. Stories were sent by telex. Teletype operators typed out a code that was transmitted over phone lines back to the newspaper, where a mechanical typewriter printed it out. Copy boys constantly monitored the teletype machines, ferrying information back and forth. And journalists covering important events jealously guarded telephone lines. White House correspondent Merriman Smith credited his 1964 Pulitzer Prize to an uncanny ability to beat rival journalists to the phone. We would ride in presidential motorcades. And in the case of Dallas, there was one phone in the car. In that time, it was known as the telephone car, and the UPI and the AP would share the phone. Well, Smitty always had the intelligence, the wit, to get into the front seat where the phone was. Anyway, he was in the front seat, and he picked up the phone and called in to our Dallas office that three shots had been fired at Kennedy's limousine. And then he kept dictating, and the AP man was beating, beating on his shoulder and trying to grab the phone from him. It was mayhem. Till they got to Parkland Hospital, and then Smitty jumped out of the car and ran in and grabbed another phone in, uh, in the hospital. By this time, he saw, a, he saw Jackie's number one Secret Service agent pounding on the car and saying he's dead. <laughs> 
In the 1960s, American correspondents once again shipped overseas, this time to cover Vietnam. To the surprise of all, the war turned into the most prolonged conflict ever fought by American GIs. It was the first time that reporters suddenly found themselves in an adversarial position with the United States government, that they found that at these famous five o'clock follies, the government briefings, that they were perpetrating lies. And the government did not want the reporters up country to be telling the truth. Well, I mean, uh being over accessible. While the government was putting pressure on newspapers to spout the party line, a new and strident voice was emerging in American journalism, the underground press. You had this explosion of colorful uh, papers interested in the hippie subculture and interested in drugs like the Berkeley Barb and the Los Angeles Free Press. And these papers were free in their opposition to the war, would print uh, scathing attacks on U.S. involvement in Vietnam that helped rally uh, young people in the United States in particular into the streets, into mass protests against the war in Vietnam. At the same time, television news was supplying an equally disturbing picture of events in Vietnam. And then in the late 1960s, CBS News, which is where Cronkite was broadcasting at the time, began to be able to bring into people's living rooms pictures of small villages in Vietnam where American soldiers were being helicoptered in to clean out the Viet Cong and Americans were seeing pictures of these thatched hut villages being burned to a crisp. Men, women, and children being killed. The pictures people were watching on their TV screens were more powerful than anything they were reading in their morning papers. As a result, the public began to pull away from the newspaper. In the 1970s, foreign correspondents working in remote locales still relied on the teletype machine to send their stories back to the States. If I traveled outside of New Delhi, then I would go to the local post office and I'd give my story over to a telex operator, most of whom didn't speak any English or couldn't read English. They just could read the characters and they would type it into the machine and uh, you take a 20-minute uh, nap or have a cup of coffee or depending on what hour it was uh, wait for the copy to clear realizing that meeting their deadlines depended on the telex many correspondents found themselves currying the favor of local operators you made sure that your telex operator had a bottle of scotch each Christmas and that was more or less it Everyone in the newspaper business accepted the fact that breaking news, by the time it appeared in the paper, was already a day old. Fifteen years ago, you couldn't get to your correspondent except by a telegram or through a telephone call that was going to take hours to get through. So it was hopeless to even think about this news cycle. So you were already gearing towards the next. But in the 1980s, this would all change. Reporters began exchanging their beloved typewriters for computers. And then in 1986, an astonishing breakthrough in communication cut the lag time between the occurrence of an event and when it was reported on television. Chinese students in Tiananmen Square were broadcast live via satellite. As a result, newspapers were driven to publish their own stories faster. During the next decade, correspondents began filing on laptops that automatically transmitted their stories over a phone line, back to the main computer terminal at their papers. The first time I used the sat phone was in 1995 with the deployment of the NATO-led forces in Bosnia. You know, you're always fumbling with a new technology and it's very fragile and you're uncertain as to whether it's going to work or not. And then 
There's no sweeter sound than that kind of that little when when you know that you're getting a line. And there's no greater sense of frustration than when you're sitting in an empty hotel room or uh, somewhere with 1,200 words of blood, sweat, and tears, and you can't get a line. You can't get out. Even when stationed in the most remote locales, satellite communication enabled correspondents to stay in constant touch with their editors. It was early 96. Um, I had a sat phone and went up to the roof of the hotel in Zagreb and you know there's a little map of where the satellites were and where you pointed and that's how you communicated. But even with the help of satellites newspapers could not match the immediacy of real-time video broadcast. Some believe that the content of newspaper articles have been influenced by fierce competition from other media. I think these days there's less that's off limits. I think that almost everything is publishable these days. I think that's partly because there are more news outlets today than there ever were. There are hundreds of radio outlets, thousands, perhaps millions of internet outlets, dozens of cable channels. Anybody can publish anything any moment they want. More and more, the job of the newspaper reporter is turned into one of interpretation and analysis. You have to be able to tell people why it's important that for them that this thing, this event is happening. Why, what this event means in their lives. And, and, and focus in on that and be able to interpret. For some, the change has been yet another harbinger of darker days yet to come for print journalism. While for others, the changes brought exciting new challenges. Most professional journalists agree that television has robbed the newspaper of much of its influence. If you can reach 10 million people with a single newscast, but barely a million with a newspaper, that demonstrates pretty clearly the shift that has occurred in the way public opinion is influenced. Where once newspapers competed with one another for an audience, they now struggle to survive in a world teeming with digital newscasts, from live video feed to the internet. The result has been a steady decline in the sheer number of publications. The tragedy is that we've become a country of one newspaper towns. For journalists, the downside is quite clear. Competition, that's the lifeblood of journalism. I think it's very, very important. I mean, if you have one newspaper in the town, they can control the news, basically. They can run the whole show. With the introduction of the Internet as yet another source of home delivery, some believe the future of print journalism is in even greater jeopardy. Others have a more optimistic view. You're not going to sit around and watch the 6 o'clock evening news anymore. You're not going to necessarily read the newspaper at breakfast anymore. You're going to punch up the internet whenever you please. And I think that the future may be in the area of delivery on demand and print broadcasters may be more capable of doing that than broadcasters. For those working at the Media Lab at MIT, the future is here. If you have an electronic form, you can add additional news for any individual without that additional cost. So suddenly there's an economic that can support my in-depth interests on a particular subject like bicycling, where I can get much, much more news about bicycling than the Boston Globe would ever think was useful or, or economical or practical to print in the paper. Today, news delivered via the Internet can be personalized to suit the needs of an individual. Many, many websites, for example, that have the word my in front of them. They give you my news, my Yahoo, my Excite, etc. And what those websites allow you to do is they allow you to specify topics of interest so you'll get additional information about those topics on a daily basis or on whatever clock cycle you choose.
Professional journalists also view the Internet as an invaluable asset. The challenge for a reporter today is using the computer as a full tool and using the Internet. The Internet's a terrific news source. A Pentagon correspondent discovered military chat rooms where soldiers were kind of talking back and forth. And you're a fly on the wall and you can pick up stories. It's a tremendous archive. The Internet is just this wealth of information for you as much as it is for me, but for me, information is my business. For those comfortable with the capabilities of digital communication, the possibilities are boundless. For instance, a newspaper published on a desktop computer can now be disseminated over the World Wide Web. We gave children the same tools and allow them to create a newspaper. And we've got a group of about 3,000 children from around the world. They, there are 139 countries represented. And they're publishing an online publication called the Junior Journal. And that newspaper is their expression about what it means to be a kid in various societies around the world. Experts believe that digital news publication has the power to transform news organizations in a positive sense. I recollect that probably close to 50% of the cost of a newspaper has nothing to do with content. It has to do with delivery of that content. So the cost of paper, the cost of ink, the cost of operating the presses, the cost of running the trucks for delivery. That, that's a lot of the expense of newspapers and wouldn't it be nice if that expense could be turned into more news news delivery over the internet may change the way consumers think about news encouraging them to take on a more active role there's value here and it, it's not high tech it's just really rethinking what are the roles that people play in news, what are the roles that people play in, in storytelling? It's not just a top-down thing anymore. It's not just a top-down medium, but it's, it's also bottom-up. It seems clear that we are at the edge of a revolution in thinking. As the Internet empowers its users with a new set of tools for exploring the world, newspapers are scrambling to adjust. Chances are they will survive and even flourish. For over the course of their 500-year-long history, they have proven themselves to be a remarkably resilient creation. Cosmonaut or astronaut, Russian or American, the pre-launch preparations are much the same. Exercises and drills that discipline the mind and toughen the body for flights into space. It is for such a journey that a Russian spaceman trains in secret in the summer of 1962. His name is Andrian Nikolaev, and at a Russian cosmodrome somewhere in Central Asia, he is ready on August 11th for blastoff. More than a million pounds of rocket thrust send the Soviet spacecraft spinning into an orbit that is 156 miles above the Earth at its peak, 113 miles at its low point. Only when cosmonaut Nikolaev is safely in orbit does the world learn of the launching. In Moscow, crowds in the streets hear radio reports from loudspeakers atop buildings in Red Square. It is a year and five days since German Titov orbited the Earth 17 times. The Russian people and the free world listen, wait, and wonder. What is the real purpose and importance of the flight of cosmonaut Andrei Nikolaev? Into the night, the spaceship and its lonely riders circled the Earth at 18,000 miles an hour, making one complete orbit every 88 minutes. Then the first in a series of spectacular space-age achievements, 
television pictures of Nikolayev taken electronically in his capsule and relayed to Earth. Viewers see the cosmonaut attempt to tie down his logbook as it floats freely in the eerie world of zero gravity. Premier Khrushchev himself takes part in a second communications link between Earth and space, a direct telephone conversation between the Russian leader and Nikolayev. The cosmonaut, who begins his broadcasts with the greeting, This is Falcon, reports all is well with himself and his spaceship. Khrushchev replies, I am glad to hear that you are fine, says the Soviet Premier, and I wish you a safe return. Top-ranking members of the Soviet Politburo are quick to see the propaganda significance of the Russian exploit. And led by Communist Party Secretary Fro Kozlov and Deputy Premier Anastas Mikoyan, they know that there is still another space conquest to come. A second cosmonaut, Pavel Popovich, is hurled into orbit 24 hours after Nikolayev. Together they will circle the Earth for three days, at one time only three miles apart. Each will travel more than a million miles in space, ending an historic journey that has taken them out of this world and back by parachuting safely to Earth. Four days after landing, the cosmonauts return to Moscow and the acclaim of their countrymen. The 32-year-old Nikolayev is on the right, the 31-year-old Popovich at his side, as Russia rolls out a red carpet 100 feet long to welcome them home. men mount the receiving stand and salute as one. Never before has anyone, even a visiting head of state, received a more spectacular and propaganda-conscious greeting. Nikolayev is embraced and kissed repeatedly by Premier Khrushchev. Next, Bapovich receives his welcome from the jubilant Khrushchev. Then a 20-mile trip to Red Square, with Nikolayev at left and Popovich riding in an open car. Here atop Lenin's tomb, the Heavenly Twins, as the Soviet newspapers call them, receive the salute of 80,000 Russians. The rest of the world joins too in applauding another milestone on mankind's journey to the stars. In America, there is no secrecy, no iron curtain, as work is completed on a jewel-encrusted satellite called Telstar, designed to span oceans and link continents through a worldwide television hookup. Three feet in diameter, weighing 170 pounds, Telstar is a relay station in space. It is crammed with 15,000 intricate parts whose purpose is to receive signals from Earth, amplify them 10 billion times, and transmit them back to the ground. The satellite marks the first time a private company has built a space vehicle and paid the cost of launching from its own funds. But most important of all, Telstar symbolizes space exploration as the peaceful servant of mankind, bringing faraway peoples, places, and events into the living room of any home, anytime, anywhere. And so in the free and open and democratic way, all the world knows and waits as the countdown for Project Telstar gets underway at Cape Canaveral. The little communication satellite is tucked in the nose of a Delta rocket that towers 90 feet above the launching pad. Forty-five million dollars in research and development, tens of thousands of man-hours. This is what they lead to. This is where they end. 
in the final fateful seconds that are for the launch crew and the rocket the inevitable moment of truth. red glow, waiting for the blinding burst of flame that will signal the igniting of the second stage. Eleven minutes after launching, Telstar is in orbit, circling the Earth every 160 minutes. Ground stations make contact and the satellite responds. It relays not only television signals, but telephone calls, still pictures, and teletype messages. Before Telstar, relaying a live transatlantic television signal would have required a mid-ocean tower at the impossible height of 150 miles. Now TV stations can reach out beyond the horizon, around the curve of the Earth. Already special telecasts have crossed the Atlantic, America to Europe, Europe to America, heralding the day when 30 or more tell stars will girdle the earth in a global network, helping nations find among themselves a common understanding, and in that understanding, a brighter hope for peace. In this search is remembered the words spoken 100 years ago by Abraham Lincoln, words about a divided country that today have equal meaning to a divided planet. The dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. As our case is new, so must we think anew and act anew. Gracious God,